ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising allah and we praise him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whomsoever allah guides there is none to misguide and whomsoever allah leaves to go astray there is none to guide and i testify that allah alone is worthy of being worshiped and that muhammad is the servant of allah and his final messenger today we are going to conclude with perhaps the most misunderstood of the concepts that we are dealing with in islam and that is the concept of jihad the word jihad has today become almost synonymous with terrorism and that's something that is very important that we need to qualify and clarify that jihad does not mean terrorism in fact when we look to the islamic sharia to the islamic law we clearly find that terrorism if we mean by terrorism the targeting of women and children and civilians in order to achieve our military political religious or ideological objectives if that's what we mean by terrorism targeting civilians then it is absolutely clear from the sharia from the islamic law from the way that has been taught to us by allah through his prophet muhammad that such a way of fighting or conducting one's affairs is not allowed in several different places the prophet muhammad is reported to have said and told the muslim armies who were fighting do not kill the women do not kill the children way of fighting or conducting one's affairs is not allowed in several different places the prophet muhammad is reported to have said and told the muslim armies who were fighting do not kill the women do not kill the children do not chop down the fruit bearing trees leave alone the churches and the synagogues and the monasteries and leave the people there to dedicate their life to what they dedicated their lives to even the prophet muhammad had prohibited the poisoning of water supplies in one particular incident we find that the prophet muhammad may god's peace and blessings be upon him after a battle had noticed that his companions were gathered around something and he said to one of the companions who was standing near him what is that what is going on over there and his companion said o oh, messenger of god it is a woman who has killed in the course of the fighting and the prophet muhammad said that is not one against whom war should be fought if the prophet muhammad showed his disapproval of a woman being killed in the actual battlefield then how possibly how possibly could islam allow targeting of women and children as an act of warfare in fact we find that the religion of islam has taught the best way the best manners the best conduct however warfare is a reality of human life islam is not a pacifist religion Islam is not a pacifist religion but it is a peaceful religion that means that muslims are not expected or required that when they are being oppressed when their lands are being invaded when their communities and their religion is being insulted that they should merely accept such a situation muslims are required and they are ordered in the quran to resist such occupation and such treatment in fact the prophet muhammad may allah's peace and blessings be upon him taught us that allah does not love the oppressor 
And Allah does not love those also who allow themselves to be oppressed. So as long as we have the ability to resist oppression, then we should do that. And so it is very clear that the Qur'an teaches a concept and Islam teaches a concept of physical conflict, especially in the case of defending oneself and defending one's land. Therefore, if one has the ability to resist this attack, even with arms and with fighting, and if that is what is required, that is what the Muslim is obliged to do. And there are many passages in the Qur'an that teach us that when this situation occurs, when our enemy attack us, then we are required to defend ourselves. And we are required to resist that oppression and resist that attack and do so in the most efficient manner. However, the Qur'an also tells us that Allah does not love the aggressors. Allah does not love those people who initiate aggression. And also that in nearly every single place in the Qur'an where Allah mentions fighting, as the Arabic word is qital, so whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the physical fighting, the actual physical violent jihad, you'll find that also Allah mentions that if they incline to peace, then you should also incline to peace. So that Islam does not seek to have a prolonged situation of aggression and conflict. In fact, peace should be the norm. Peace should be the normal situation. Fighting, physical fighting, is a last resort. It's something that we have to resort to when there is no other means or no other way. However, the word jihad, although often does refer to a physical conflict in the Qur'an, often the word jihad is used to mean the physical type of fighting. The word does have in the Sharia a much broader meaning and a much broader context. Literally the word jihad means to struggle. This is what the actual word in Arabic means. In fact, it means to struggle to the utmost of one's ability. To struggle to the utmost of one's ability to do what? To get money, to take other people's property, to get booty. The sharia, the way that leads to Allah on this earth, that is when truly we will have real peace on this planet. So jihad is the struggle in order to do that. And it could be, primarily it is, an internal struggle. The first place that the jihad takes place is within one's own self, within one's own soul. This is known as jihad bil nafs, the jihad against your own passions and your own desires. Because this is the reality of life. Life is a test. Allah has created this world the way it is to test us. Will we obey God or disobey God? And that's why there is poverty and wealth, health and sickness, beauty and ugliness, and so on and so forth. All of these things are a test to see will we obey God or not. And one of the things that is part of that test is that we have desires. The human being has passions, desires. There are many things that we desire. Money, wealth, children, land, houses, successful businesses, to be beautiful, to be famous, power, knowledge. There are many, many desires in addition to these that the human beings have. But the jihad of oneself is the fight to control these desires, to control them so that we are always within the boundaries of what the Sharia or what the Islamic law teaches, that we do not transgress or go beyond those things that God has forbidden and prohibited for us, that we always stay within the realm of what is allowed. 
In fact, one of the beautiful things about the Sharia is that in general everything is allowed except those things that have been specifically prohibited. This is in terms, of course, of the worldly things. In terms of actual, the religious actions, the actual acts of worship, it's the other way around. When it comes to worshipping God, we can only worship God the way that has been prescribed. We can't invent new ways to worship God. We can't uh, introduce new systems or new ways or new acts of worshipping God. We have to confine ourselves to the way that has been taught to us by the Sharia. But in terms of other things, in terms of what we can eat, what we can drink, uh, the things that we can do, it is all lawful and it's all allowed except the things that God has prohibited. So this is the struggle, the internal struggle, that I should make my soul and my mind and my heart in a state of obedience and submission to God. So that in my mind and in my heart is the love of Allah. And the love of Allah, the love of God, is more than anything else. And that I put my faith in Allah, and my trust in Allah, and my hope in Allah. This is the internal struggle that takes place. And one aspect of this internal struggle is the struggle against the archetypal enemy, the great and sworn enemy of human beings, Iblis or Satan. Satan is one of the jinn. And he lived with the angels when Allah or God first created the first human being, Adam. Allah said to all the angels, I'm going to create a successor on the earth. In other words, that God was announcing to the angels that he was going to create a creature on the earth that would succeed one generation after the other. And the angel said, oh Allah, are you going to create a creature that is going to cause mischief and shed blood? But Allah said to the angels, I know what you don't know. Anyway, Allah created Adam. And Allah told the angels to bow down to Adam. And they all bowed down, except Iblis, who was one of the jinn. Iblis refused. And Allah said, oh Iblis, what is wrong with you that you are not bowing with those who are bowing? And Iblis, or the devil, or shaitan said, I am better than him. You made me from smokeless fire. You made him from clay. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, was going to expel Iblis. But Iblis said, Oh God, give me respite. Give me until the last day. And I will misguide this humanity, this human beings. I will take them away from your straight path. And I will bring them all with me to hellfire, except some chosen few. So therefore, our sworn enemy is Iblis. So the other jihad is the jihad against the devil or the jihad against Iblis. It's a battle that goes on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. From one descendant to another descendant, it's an ongoing battle. And so this is another jihad, the jihad against shaitan. And the devil attacks us with what? He puts into our head doubts. Doubts about Allah, doubts about his religion. And he stirs up within us our desires and our passions. And through that tries to mislead us away from obedience to Allah. So the other jihad is to fight this impulse, to fight this misguidance. This is the other type of jihad. Then we have the jihad of the tongue or the jihad of the pen. This is when a person speaks out against injustice, wrongdoing tyranny. With their mouth they try to forbid what is evil and enjoin what is good. To call people to the true message of Islam, of submission to God, of the Quran, of the guidance that was given to Prophet Muhammad. This is what we call the jihad of the tongue or the jihad of the pen. And this is another aspect of jihad. Then ultimately and finally we have that final type of jihad that we have mentioned and that is the jihad with the sword or the physical jihad that involves fighting and again this is specifically and only in order to defend the religion of Islam the lands of Islam someone once came and asked the Prophet Muhammad 
O Messenger of God, one of us fights in order that he may be known as a brave fighter. Another one fights in order to capture booty. Another one fights for his tribe, or fights like for his, or for example, fights for his country, an equivalent maybe. Which one of us, he said, is fighting jihad? The Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said. The one who fights to make the word of Allah, obedience to Allah the highest, this one is fighting jihad. And so this jihad, this struggle to manifest and to make clear and to make uppermost obedience to God, to make predominant that way of true peace and true happiness, this is an intrinsic, vital, an essential part of the religion of Islam. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, he described it as the peak of the matter, the very peak of this matter of Islam. And it is this jihad, this struggle, this fight to make obedience and submission to God the uppermost that is so essential and important to the success to the actual success of the Muslim individual and the Muslim nation collectively. Indeed, the Prophet Muhammad said that when we abandon this struggle, when we abandon this struggle, when we leave it and we become happy with our daily lives, going to work, farming the fields, doing our business, when we leave the struggle to make Allah's word the highest, and when we just become content with our daily lives, then we will find that Allah will allow our humiliation. In other words, we will find ourselves in a bad condition. We will find ourselves humiliated. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad said, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, that Allah will not lift this humiliation from us until we come back to our deen. And the word deen in Islam means, it's often translated as religion, means our way, our way of life, our manner. And so that means that the very heart, the heart of the Muslim way of life, and the very heart of our manner and our character must be this struggle, this fight to make obedience to God dominant within ourselves and amongst the people around us. However, it is very important to point out that Islam does not allow us to compel anyone to be Muslim. It is very clearly stated in the Quran, La ikrah fiddin. There is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Islam itself means a willing submission to God. And it is true that some people need to be encouraged in a certain way, but actually compelling or forcing people to become Muslim, this is antithetical to what Islam teaches. In fact, it is a great myth that Islam was spread by the sword. It is true that in the early days of Islam, when the Muslims were subjugated to attacks and constant attacks by the Roman Empire at the time and by the Persian Empire at the time, the Muslims had to fight in order to defend themselves. And since those empires stretched for great areas, then ultimately the Muslim armies occupied many of those lands that were formerly the lands of the Persian and the Roman Empire. But it is noteworthy that no Muslim armies went to Malaysia. No Muslim armies went to Indonesia, the single most populous Muslim country in the world. In fact, Africa, the continent that has the most Muslims in it, especially uh, Central Africa, no or very few Muslim armies entered into that area. So many of the lands where we find Islam today, it was not spread there by the sword. In fact, we find a remarkable phenomenon taking place. That in the West, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the West today. 
and Islam is growing at astronomical rates in the West and in the world at general. And there are no Muslim armies. There is no one in the West forcing people to become Muslim at the point of a sword. Yet Islam is still growing. This shows that the impetus, this shows that the reason why people accept Islam is not to do with forceful conversion. It is to do with the intrinsic nature of the Islamic truth. It is to do with the sublime and beautiful message of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. Of course, every Muslim has the duty to convey the message of Islam in the best manner possible. And that could be done either through words or more importantly through our behavior through displaying the noble and the good characteristics that every Muslim should have of truthfulness and honesty, trustworthiness, keeping our promises and fulfilling our pledges and our trusts, our honesty in business dealings. These were the very things that attracted so many millions of people to Islam. And they are the very qualities that Muslims need to display in their everyday life. And Still many Muslims do display those qualities and all praise is due to Allah. So this imperative, this need to convey the message of Islam is important. We invite people to Islam, that's our job. The word da'wah means invitation. We can't make anybody Muslim, that's not our job. It is not my task or responsibility to actually make a person Muslim, no. My job is to invite them, to explain to them, to propound to them those teachings of Islam, what they are really about. But it is Allah alone who guides people. It is Allah who guides those people who are truly worthy and deserving of this noble and beautiful religion of Islam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.